So I'm going to talk about how like non-transferable objects call SBTs, and again, they can also be VCs, uh, well, can transform science starting like on all social scales, starting with like how we cultivate individual reputation in science, how we have communities of scientists, how we build markets and fund science, to like how we build larger scientific networks. And the principles that I'm going to describe here, because I'm fundamentally talking about actually building networks, they also apply to like how we think about other networks in general, whether they be energy, information, financial, social, right? These are all the future technological you know, networks that like may come to dominate us, right? Um, and so hopefully like we can think of alternatives that are grounded in principles with other thinkers. My favorites being Hayek on local knowledge, Eleanor Ostrom, her work on the commons, and in the case of science, Michael Polanyi. Okay, so I gotta skip some slides and move fast. So let's get to the individual. How can a non-transferable NFT transform how we think about scientific reputation, and particularly the economics of reputation markets? So as a scientist, you know you have to publish or perish in a prestigious journal, and you're trading in for status, right? And you rely on peer reviewers who also trade their free labor and their work for status as well. And you know, universities will pay for your research um, and, and pay for this research, but then have to like, see it like, pay on the other end again to like, read it right when it's published. And then, of course, there's tax buyers, taxpayers who also subsidize this research, which stays closed. So like our current system in the economics of scientific reputation, as you all know, is like the researchers and peer reviewers don't get paid. The labs and universities are poor. Science and research stays closed. And what we have is increased knowledge monopolies and like a Matthew effect in the production of scientific knowledge. Right. Um, so how can uh, SBTs help here? Well, um, as a first step, you can imagine universities, labs, and societies issuing non-transferable NFTs or SBTs to represent existing affiliations or credentials or memberships. So I went to Stanford, I went to Columbia, those would be an SBT. I worked at, or theoretically worked at the Broad, I'm gonna pretend I'm Niklas and I worked at the Broad Institute. I have that right as an SBT. I have certain pa papers published, those are also SBTs. So um, if uh, these um, credentials and affiliations were issued, um, then we start to get a picture of what's like a scientific social graph and we start to see overlapping competencies. We can see Neve and I, we both attended Stanford, like right there are these overlapping networks and you start to get this like picture of a scientific social graph. Now I just wanna pause here um, and say that I'm assuming a case of publicity here. Uh, there's been a lot of like questions around privacy and socially programmable privacy around non-transferable NFTs and SDTs. I'm assuming publicity precisely in this use case because science is something that we want to be open, right? And we want to be like transparent and people, scientists in particular, want to make very public what their accomplishments, what their you know, affiliations and their credentials are in their publications. So, you know, this is in the, under the premise and umbrella of open science here. So, okay, so step two in disrupting the reputation monopoly is you can imagine universities just forking off a small fraction of their funds to what's like a research DAO, the research DAO uh, offering researchers prizes to publish and also you know, turning peer reviewers into peer awarders and compensating them. And because nobody's getting paid right now, like nobody's getting paid, it doesn't have to be a lot of money, right? But you can kind of like uh, import the based off of the SBTs representing credentials and affiliations, you can actually kind of like piggyback on status, right? And recreate that status network in a decentralized way and actually reward peer reviewers, researchers, and universities over time pay less. Research goes from closed to being open and like our knowledge production goes from being monopolistic to competitive. Um, so I wanna like, uh, I'm gonna like try to power through. I don't know how much time I have. Uh, I wanna take this one. Okay, 20 minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, this is gonna be like record time, so. Save all your questions. So like, let's move up the social stack in terms of the production of scientific knowledge. Let's talk about scientific communities. How can soulbound tokens or non-transferable NFTs or VCs change that as well? Well, as you know, we have a reproducibility and traceability crisis, right? So what can SBTs do? Well, they can add peer reproduction onto the peer review process. How? Well, take us a step back again. SBTs represent your constellation of like accomplishments, achievements, credentials, and affiliations as a scientist. When I publish a research paper as a scientist, I can also tag certain, certain SBTs signifying or referring to experimental conditions 
you know, which must be satisfied for the experiment, right? And then you can imagine as a second step, DAOs contracting those experiments across a randomized set of, say, Niklas's credentialed, credentialed labs to reproduce those experiments. And so in this way, you can actually get traceability in experiments where the SBTs give you lab and equipment provenance. This was done in Biohazard Level Lab 7 with this you know, microscope X. Um, and OK, like I'm going to throw in the blockchain here. Blockchain inclusion can give you uh, the source of funding, the time, and economic beneficiaries and make common knowledge uh, where the sources of funding were, who did the research, when, um, and where. So that's super cool. Another thing that these non-transferable objects can do is they can help us convene novel scientific communities to solve intersectional problems. So say I'm interested in the intersection of like cancer and physics, for example, right? I can, because we have this like uh, social graph that's representing these credentials and affiliations, I can actually say as a funder, convene intersectional communities of physicists and biologists and cancer researchers, and also offer incentives, say for example, quadratic funding to encourage cooperation amongst these different groups for collaboration and co-discovery. The other thing that uh, these non-transferable objects allow us to do is they also create a kind of like, uh, enable a kind of specialization of labor in the production of scientific knowledge, where instead of like a soup to nuts research labs, you can have specialization of researchers, experimenters, and like peer reproducers, uh, curation, and uh, as a, say, uh, scientific hypothesizer, I can actually use and compute over SVTs to like have experiments run again in a randomized way across different actors in the space rather than having everything done under one roof and in the end create what is plurally and partially owned research um, by many groups across um, uh, across universities and across uh, geographies rather than trying to do everything under one roof. The other really cool thing that these non-transferable objects can do is they can help us align incentives. So again, uh, Computing over SBTs, you're able to convene researchers and subjects, uh, researchers on a particular issue, but also you can convene in subjects. So say I am a cancer uh, patient, or say I have a particular gene, and this is where you would want to have some maybe programmable privacy in here, but if I uh, consent to having um, that uh, you know, uh, SBT disclosed, signifying that I have this particular gene um, to say some set of universities, I can be convened with researchers who are also interested in that. And more importantly, what the SBTs also enable me to do is uh, have empower myself with, say, residual rights over negotiating the use of my you know, genetic data um, and negotiating, in particular, the uses and abuses and economic rights with researchers. Um, and in this way, we can actually use these non-transferable objects to align incentives of scientists with their subjects. And we move. Back to this, uh, back to the community on a on a broader level, away from sort of coercive, siloed, opaque, zero-sum, um, bundled science to science that is more cooperative, pluralistic, reproducible, traceable, positive sum, and decomposed across uh, subjects and scientists. So, okay, what, how much time do I have? Uh, no, Forty-five. Have Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. You're racing through. I'm yeah. racing through it, but I can keep going. But I'm saying a lot, and I might be losing people. So maybe I should stop and take some questions. Yeah? Or should I keep going? Should I keep going? Do you want to talk about markets for science? Markets? Okay, all right, let's talk about it. So who pays for it? Okay, 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 good. So who pays for it, right? Um, and this is like a really, this is a really interesting question. So Michael Plani is one of my favorite philosophers of science, but one of the things that he never really answered was like, who's going to pay for it, right? Because like, and, and what is the relationship between markets and the production of scientific knowledge? Because science should be done for science's sake and for truth's sake, right? But like, as soon as you have a funder coming in, right? they have their own motives, they're more interested in X, you're more interested in Y. Like, how do we actually build truly decentralized scientific networks? right? So what is the spectrum of scientific funding today? We have, on the one hand, public funding, which is like more government science, right? bleeding into university of science. On the other hand, we have VC science, and what I'll call you know, dog token science, which is sort of like DeFi dystopia meets science. right? And we have to like, be aware of that dystopia. right? Um, and so the, you know, both of these have their flaws public and, and, their, and their strengths. Public funding, their flaws is it tends to be slow, maybe underfunded, long-term, and it can be subject to politicization, politicization and regulatory capture. Private funding, on the other hand, as we know, is susceptible to rent extraction, you know, patent life, 
uh, closed science or trade secrets. Um, I'm curious about your presentation, and uh, and and also it tends to be more short term on a you know on the the horizon of of a fund, right, eight to ten years. So the other the other drawback to these funding models is that they really don't scale beyond the narrow interests of whoever is on the NIH board or whoever is sitting at the funding table, or even in the case of an IPNFT, like who's interested in that IPNFT, right? It doesn't scale beyond those narrow interests. Nor, and this is most importantly, does it harness the local knowledge among scientists themselves, right? So how can SBTs or these non-transferable objects change that? Well, we can actually enable really novel bottom-up funding mechanisms where scientists can help allocate funding towards other scientists. So I'm a big fan of uh, quadratic funding and uh, quadratic voting. And you can imagine scientists uh, say in like the quadratic funding case, there can be matching pools where scientists have to, I don't know, allocate like you know one to ten dollars and then it's matched uh, quadratically um, and that can be like a way or, or you can have it done with quadratic voting they can vote allocation of the of the pool um, and then you can also because you have SBTs and you have these non-transferable objects representing the credentials and affiliations and producing this like social network right scientific social network graph for us you can actually discount based off of how correlated these scientists are. So, you know, the physicists don't swap the mechanism because they understand the mathematics of it better, maybe than say, like the biologists or something like that, or you don't have collusion amongst like scientific, you know, social groups or networks. You really need to solve the collusion problem, right? And so with, with um, SBTs, you, are, you can do this important discounting function to offset this what can be intentional collusion or maybe even accidental overcoordination, right? Um, and, and what this does is it, it harnesses the sort of latent tacit knowledge amongst these scientific networks. And when you actually try, when, when you actually do discounts across difference and you try to say, um, get consensus between very differently affiliated scientists, um, what it does is it possibly, and this is something to be like tested, what it could do is actually surface more intersectional discoveries. Uh, which tend to like not really surface so easily today, right? It's kind of like the intersections of biology and physics. It's it's the intersections of chemistry and 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 biology where like really interesting stuff happens. And it's those intersections uh, and a mechanism like cooperation across difference or consensus across difference, quadratic funding with correlation discounts. That's like those intersections could be surfaced. Also, you could do other experiments. Like if you don't really like quadratic funding and correlation discounts, you can do say prediction markets and SBTs and start to like surface and, and see which ex, you know, experts actually are good at predicting like certain breakthroughs on different timelines. So it just opens up this massive possibility space to see um, what, is, what, what, what funding, what consensus models among scientists themselves actually generate uh, and fund uh, innovations. Um, and in this way, we can move towards a kind of network science, or what Polanyi calls a republic science, where scientists, you know, their local knowledge is harnessed. You get incentives for co-creation and collaboration. You get more intersectional birth, novel scientific communities, um, and, and by extension, broader coordination networks and more scientific breakthroughs. Last point, I want to. So far, I've talked about harnessing the local knowledge of scientists. I've talked about, you know, we all we all know funders and VCs and their incentives, but like. Who does science actually serve? It serves people, right? And you know, people also have their needs. And right, science and one perspective of science is science for science's sake. Another perspective is science is to alleviate suffering. So one thing you could also do is create matching pools for beneficiaries of science. So um, you know, cancer patients or whoever, or just the population broadly. And with quadratic funding and matching and correlation discounts there too, you can have allocations towards science by the population broadly. And in this way, DSI can emerge, and in my view, as a third way between both public and private funding, and DSI, you know, surfacing the breakthroughs and expertise in science for science sake with bottom-up funding from scientists, but also science for, to alleviate suffering um, with a more public-minded sake uh, uh, arising, arising from the bottom-up consensus of beneficiaries and communities. Um, okay, that's it. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, awesome talk, really enjoyed it. Um, I guess there's, there's one 
Yeah. So I think that they're like science, a lot of what you're trying to maximize for is reproducibility. Yeah. Right. And so like there is some degree of correlation that you do want to see, right? Before it starts becoming like diminishing returns. So how, how do you think about that? As a so yeah, a couple, a couple of thoughts. One is the correlation discounts was introduced in the idea of how do we allocate scientific funding? So if you want to like harness the knowledge of scientists themselves, then it's like, and you, and I have an intuition that like, I would really like to see what is the consensus amongst the most different scientists, because that's probably an underserved field. But if you wanted to like, say like tether it to reality and like which scientists are actually like having more reproducible results, you could also also introduce that and reproducibility. And especially if you have this sort of decentralized ecosystem of like reproducible experiments, right? And you get very strong reproducibility, then you could also introduce that as well. I mean, the, the, the nice thing about introducing this like simple non-transferable object is it just opens a possibility space for so many different kinds of like funding models, maybe funding that prioritizes reproducibility and consensus across difference, or maybe just reproducibility within physics, right? Like you can, and you can run the experiments and you can even like introduce prediction markets in there as well. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm curious about how you get all of us going. So I was, I was inside um, the Berkman Institute for Data Science. Yeah. Know, like when, they, not, when they started the uh, grant from Warren Sloan Foundations and it was supposed to be this whole new kind of like open data science reproducibility revolution. Yeah. And even amongst the universities that got the money, <clears throat> they could not change the culture and just the basic yeah. incentives for building a career for scientists. Yeah. And um, so I'm hoping that you don't get bogged down and top down, but you have some plan for getting this started yeah. so it can kind of bubble up and emerge and the old heads can come around if they want mm -hmm. or just die off. So I think this is where like the kind of crypto degen ethos is like very useful, right? Yeah. You know, and just and just like right and and like you know you want well first of all scientists like they trade in status, right? And so anything that gives them status like and gives them an advantage over their peers like they will take, right? And so okay, so there's some non-transferable NFTs being issued by the university. Like why wouldn't I do that and get access to like some amount of funding possibly. So I think it's gonna be a mix of like new funding, like philanthropists coming in and saying like, okay, I, I know um, like DSI Labs is doing like work on like trying to disrupt journals. And, and so a mix of kind of like the entrepreneurs in the space with funders and like universities themselves seeing that we need to move beyond like this rent extraction journal model, right? Like Harvard, for example, I think is like, didn't they, didn't they like threaten to pull the plug this year? I'm paying for journals. Um, yeah, and, and but I was just yeah, Berkeley, right? Berkeley did it. Yeah. Um, but I just don't know how many will. Uh, is there any way that you don't have to wait for the university to issue the token? Yeah, so you could also have like peer to peer networks yeah. and peer-to-peer -peer -peer scientific net, but it just the problem is with that is you really have to be careful with bots. Right. Right. And so you need to start with very thick communication channels. So like one way I was thinking about is like there's like a small, say small journals like physics journal like some random area of physics or math obscure where there's just like i don't know 100 or 200 or maybe a thousand max people right and they can kind of self-police mm -hmm. to issue the credential um and fork away from that journal and like take those rent extracted profits for themselves and internalize that like that's kind of like where i would start if i was an entrepreneur in the space but i know like dci labs is doing like some really interesting work in, in, in combination with protocol labs to like actually bootstrap this cool. yeah go ahead uh hi my name is shadi mm -hmm. um great talk how do you think about scale in these systems right so uh, a lot of these spts or records on chain records are individual um they, they mark an individual and in their contributions mm -hmm. And how do you think about interactions within individuals in a society and society's interactions across each other and governance mechanisms that align or allow societies to differentiate from each other? Yeah, so this kind of goes like back to the broader question about how do we think about networks, right? And so it's not just science. It's also like energy, information, finance, you know, TradFi or DeFi, right? Even like social information. And I would say like the question more broadly applies to all of these networks that, that are interlocking, right? And, and, and having their own power struggles like amongst each other, right? 
right? And so what we really want is pluralistic, at least what I want is pluralistic decentralized ownership of these networks where the networks are accountable to the users and the producers of value. And to do that, we actually need to have a one-to-one -one alignment of you, you, you know, governance and user, like, you know, ownership, right? And, and the kind of current state of affairs in both TradFi and DeFi, in Web3 and, and Web2, is actually separating those two, which end up being traded up to plutocratic interests, right? And forming their own kind of monopolies. And so that's like against the decentralization of power. So I think fundamentally what we need to do is ground um, the, these, these networks in, in the users that build them, that create the value, and what these non-transferable objects, which are socially programmably private in certain contexts. I'm, in science, I did the publicity, extreme publicity case. But um, when you have these like non-transferable objects, they let people have social provenance on who else is in that network, and, and you can balance governance mechanisms there. Maybe I can mm -hmm. elaborate with um, mm -hmm. uh, like an adversarial example, uh -huh. where you might have, like say, the society of pro-heliocentricism, right? Like that this, everything revolves around the sun. Then you have a society of pro-terracentricism. Mm -hmm. um, Pro-what? Terracentricism? Yeah, that everything uh -huh. revolves around the yeah. other. And um, you could imagine, perhaps, you know, fluctuating market dynamics, that one might have the advantage over the other. And how important is it? Or how do we think about um, either, like, intersections across those societies or ways that kind of prevent us from reinventing corporations. Right? So I think this, actually this binary example is interesting. I think the current structure of our communication information protocols precisely is turning us into this kind of binary yeah. binary groups and, and erasing and writing over the richness and diversity of our beliefs and experiences and actually narrow, and precisely because the structure of our communication information channels is to auction off our intention and auction it off in a way that like the, the, the most, Profitable way to do that is to like you know induce fight or flight responses and introduce conflicts and cleavages where they don't exist. So like all of my work is actually around finding ways to build bridges and consensus across difference and restructure technology and information pipes to avoid this kind of like binary cleavages and that are artificial. Yeah. All right. I think that's it. Oh, I can't believe we ended this on fire. Thank you. Yeah.